And, um, okay, so, um, yeah, I do a podcast I've been doing for a couple of years, and you know, I've interviewed, interviewed a whole bunch of people uh, in addition to my blog. And, you know, we do this thing called Pacifist Fight Club. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that's how you and I originally got connected. Okay, excellent. And I think we also have some mutual friends. I know, I think you know Brent Russo, but I think you also know a guy named Herb Montgomery. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good, good guys. Tell Herb I said hi. Did you uh, I get to talk with him very often? Yeah, you know, he came out here about a year ago, and uh, we got to hang out for a couple of hours. Just an awesome guy. And I'm actually on the board. Uh, I'm a member of the board of his Renewed Heart Ministries. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's a great guy. I only really met him. Uh, I've dialogued with him several times, but only met him in person once. But uh, yeah, he really gets the he really gets the heart of God. Oh yeah, he that's what I love about him, man. He has such a great heart for the Lord, and I'm yeah. blessed every time I see him. Yeah, excellent, excellent. All right. Great. So um, yeah, I, I've got a few things to talk about, and uh, I'm sure it's nothing that you haven't talked about a thousand times. But hopefully, we'll uh, have a good dialogue. And then uh, uh, the main thing I want to talk about, I think, is the nonviolence idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we may we may also touch on, you know, a little bit like Christians and politics and a little bit of the Old Testament versus New Testament and that kind of stuff. I'll go wherever you want to go. How, how long are you thinking this is going to be? Um, if we could do like around 40 minutes, that'd be great. All right. Are you OK for that? Yep. Yep. About quarter to two. I, I need to uh, wrap it up. So, OK, that's great. You just let me know when you're ready. So All what right. I'm going to do, I'm not actually going to upload this this actual video. I'm recording just the audio. And then what I'll do is just grab out the audio portion of the interview and, you know, put it, the music in front, drop, mm -hmm. you know, introduction. Then I'll sure. come on with the conversation and then I'll close it out. So right. we're just going to yeah. play three, two, one and start and I'll, I'll start. But I, I, I appreciate Skyping anyways, because I have trouble talking on the phone. Uh, maybe it's my ADD or something, but I have to close my eyes and visualize the person. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's not concrete enough. Okay. All right, go have at it. Okay, great. So, um, uh, as you know, it seems like Christians in America especially seem to be very confused about this notion that uh, Jesus was an advocate for peace and that he wanted and even expected his disciples also to be nonviolent. So without getting into whether that's true or not, uh, although I know you, where you fall on that, and I fall on the same side of that, but why do you think it is that Christians struggle with this idea? Uh, because it strikes them as so counterintuitive. I mean, it just seems insane to people it, it, we're, we're so conditioned by a violent culture and by the use of violence to solve problems that uh when jesus comes along and and says never retaliate you know turn the other cheek uh love your enemies um it, it just strikes us as insane that he would mean by that that we're actually supposed to do that to enemies who are threatening us or or something of the sort and so uh Really, since the fifth century on, Christians have been willing to do tremendous gymnastics, uh, exegetical gymnastics, to get around that. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, but it just strikes us. It's counterintuitive, and also um, it's scary. I think a lot of people are scared, for afraid of that. I mean, why do people, uh, you know, keep on going along with this illusion that having guns keeps them safe? Uh, it gives them this false security, even though all the studies in the world suggest that having a gun, bringing it into a conflict situation, greatly increases your chance of getting killed. Right. Uh, but uh, it still gives you a false sense of security. We want to be empowered, you know. Uh, and to obey Jesus means we have to be willing to let go of our life and to trust in him. And, um, I, and that's hard for people to do. Yeah. And what I think is, what I personally find fascinating and confounding about what you're talking about is, I totally agree with you, you know, that when you, when you introduce this idea, and usually it's always Christians that argue back the most and the loudest and the most passionately that how dare you suggest. I actually had a pastor threaten to kick my butt if I was going to continue to suggest that Jesus <laughs> was nonviolent. But, uh, but, it's, but the thing that's weird about it is the, um, the idea that Jesus is supposed to be practical. I mean, it, I agree what you're saying, that, there, you know, that it hits our brain. The idea hits our brain and we say, well, that can't be what Jesus meant. That just seems so impractical, as if everything else he said was just so practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the kingdom is practical. Yeah, it, well, it, it, you're right. You're right. It, it's, it strikes us as profoundly impractical, and in the short run, it is, uh, or it could be at least. But on the other hand, you know, the longer I've lived in this thing, and uh, you know, just kind of grown into it, um, the more I'm coming to see that that his teaching is actually incredibly practical. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've ever read uh, John uh, Howard Yoder's book, mm -hmm. What Would You Do? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's, a, it's a philosophical reflection, uh, the age-old question. Someone breaks into your house and threatens you and your family, yes. what are you going to do? Yeah. And he just, without appealing to scripture or anything, he just sort of you know, plays it out uh, in very logical, practical ways, showing that it actually makes all the sense in the world to respond as nonviolently as possible. Uh, and to not resort uh, to, you know, the ultimate defense of, of uh, killing them if you need to. And so I, I actually think, and, and there's a lot of studies that show this. Um, yes. I, just here in uh, uh, the Twin Cities, I guess it was two or three years ago, there's an instance where uh, a young man broke into this house to steal the stereo system. The dad, uh, the father, hears it upstairs, and, and so he, he has a piece. He grabs his gun and comes down and confronts this young man. Now, see... What happened is he just changed a, uh, a stereo system poker game into a life and death poker game. Right. Uh, this kid is far more road savvy than the father is, far more willing to use a gun than the father is, uh, and isn't about to go back to jail. He sees that the father's nervous holding this thing, and so he distracts the father a little bit, and they get into a, uh, a wrestling match over this gun. He's going for the gun. Uh, well, as they're wrestling, the wife comes downstairs to check out what's going on. The gun goes off. She gets killed. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that that, that father would, would gladly uh, trade a million stereo systems to have his wife back. Yep. But he, he's the one who changed the poker game. Uh, and so it's, uh, uh, it, it actually makes a, a lot more sense uh, than we might think. It's just that when you're conditioned to immediately go for the final solution, to grab the gun, uh, and you find security in that, well, then in that framework, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and why, why would we ever equate... Uh, the value of a human life with a TV or a DVD player or a video game system or something like that. It's, it's, especially or, or, as a Christian. Well, or, or anything. I mean, uh, you know, the father probably thought he was, the guy thought he was just protecting his family. Uh, and I can understand that, but um, that, that's not the, the, the right way to, to go about it. Um, you know, and so I, what I, what I encourage people to do, uh, Keith is, is this, is that, uh, when, when they are just strongly resistant to this, they're offended by it, they're hurt by it. Um, I try to show them that what Jesus did mean, uh, actually to love our enemies, the worst kind of enemies, because when he says enemies, most, uh, you know, for Jews, the Romans come to mind. And the right. Romans are basically uh, you know, the, the terrorists who have already won. Yeah. They're living under a terrorist rule. The Romans were experts in terror and, and unjust and oppressive. And He's saying love and pray for and do good to those kinds of people. Okay, if, if people can't handle that, I get that, because I, I couldn't for, you know, up until 10 years ago. Um, I, 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 I suggest this. Well, maybe, uh, since Jesus is Lord, um, uh, if something he says strikes us as, as wrong, even immoral, uh, we have to assume that we're in the wrong. Right. But maybe if we just since people usually don't have people break into their house and threaten their families, if you just start loving your enemies in little ways now, I mean, just try, try praying for the worst people in your life and for the national enemies, uh, you know, and, and just ask God to bless them and to free them from their bondage or whatever. Maybe if we practice uh, peacemaking and nonviolence in all the little ways that intersect with our life, maybe in a, in a year or five or 10, if a guy ever actually broke into our home, we'd, we would, have the kind of character that would see the sense of it. Yeah. Uh, that it, so it's not just a rule we're obeying. It's supposed to be a, a character that we're displaying. And characters take time to develop. And so I encourage people, just start living this way under the authority of Christ. And maybe in time, you'll actually see the sense it makes. It's, it's like, uh, you know, if someone breaks into your house, you, you, no one's thinking about grabbing a rule book to say, what rule am I supposed to, uh, supposed to obey? You operate out of your character. Right. But so you think of the difference it would make if... Uh, the person breaking into your house and threatening you and your wife was not a stranger, but was your son. Right. Maybe you went crazy, a mental illness. You'd still want to get in the way of him harming your, your, your spouse, and maybe you'd even have to be willing to die for it, but you wouldn't automatically go for the final solution. You, you, you wouldn't just kill him. Right. Uh, the, and when you genuinely love a person who's threatening you, when you genuinely are doing it, not just out of obedience to a rule, but you genuinely love them, it opens the door to a million possibilities, alternative ways of stopping this, that, that you'd never have if you just went for the, the uh, jugular. Right. Um, and you're giving God a chance to speak and intervene in the situation uh, that can maybe prevent it in some God-glorifying ways. But all those are shut down the minute you display the gun.
Right. No, I love that. That's exactly right. And I love what you said, because I've had a similar sort of uh, change of tactic myself lately. I mean, I've been blogging quite a lot about nonviolence and these kind of things. And usually those those conversations are really, like you're saying, big concept ideas. Is war, mm -hmm. what about just war? And, you know, um, or even like you said, what are these these kind of crazy scenarios that hopefully none of us will ever actually be find ourselves in? Mm -hmm. and, and what I realized, like you're saying, is what it really, I, I, what I realized I needed to change my tactic and back it up and say to, to, to Christians, to my brothers and sisters in Christ who resist this idea, what you're saying, which is Jesus very clearly commanded us to love. I mean, the first commandment, right? It's to love God and to love others. Uh, and and we have to start there. And then, then we move out, you know, kind of outside this concentric circle. Then we love, uh, you know, the person who's outside our home, our neighbor. Mm -hmm. Then we love uh, the stranger. Then we love our enemy. It kind of moves outward. But we, mm -hmm. by by starting the conversation way out on the edge of the circle about right, the enemy, right, right. Uh, I think the people's resistance to that idea is sort of a litmus test of the fact that they're not doing a very good job of loving those people in the center closer to that circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Helping people understand, like you said, how how do I just love my own family, my own wife, more than I love myself, my own children more than I love myself? That should be easy for most of us. But then, how do I love my coworker that really annoys me? How mm -hmm. do I love that guy, my neighbor next door? And if, by practically right, right. walking those things out, Jesus can lead us into something, like you said, more of a character. Mm -hmm. So it, it, what, what typically happens, and I think this is what happened in church history, uh, starting around the 5th century, two things. One is, we uh, um, instead of saying, let's just start taking baby steps and maybe you know, we'll be able to grow into this kind of character, people usually operate the other way around. It's, it, they start with the obviousness, wrongness of the teaching if you apply it to actual enemies. And they say, well, since it would be immoral for me not to protect my family and my kids, uh, then it, Jesus certainly can't mean that when he says love enemies. Of course, if I'm going to protect my, if I'm willing to kill uh, for my family and uh, uh, my, my spouse, why wouldn't I do that for my neighbor? Uh, he certainly couldn't mean that when he said uh, he couldn't refer to you know enemies that threaten my neighbor when he said love your enemies. But if I if I would defend my neighbor, why wouldn't I defend my state? If I defend my state, why wouldn't I defend my country? And now we're into just war theory. Yes. You know, it's like. And now Jesus' teaching gets watered down to, you know, be nice to grouchy neighbors or something. You know, right. it, it, it's completely got its teeth taken out. Um, and, and so we, we kind of think our way into a total compromise of, of Jesus' teaching. And just war theory accomplishes absolutely nothing because no one goes into a war thinking it's unjust. Everybody already does just war. It's just a way of feeling good about, you, you, you know, rallying your troops around, around this particular thing. Uh, the, the second thing then is that, that, uh, starting with the 5th century, the framework in which people ask these questions is a Constantinian Christendom framework. Mm -hmm. um, well, people, I got a lot just in the last several months, what would you do with ISIS? You know, uh, well, how would a pacifist, you know, respond to that? Do you really want the Muslims to come and take over America and be under Sharia law and all that? Well, see, that is, that's a Christendom question because it presupposes that our job is to run the world. Right. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think it's our job to, that was, when we when we took up the mantle of running the world, you, you can't run it without a sword. And so, uh, you know, that's when we, we traded the cross for the sword. And um, uh, our job, it was never to run the world. It's to serve the world and bleed for the world, trusting that that is the kind of thing that's going to ultimately transform the world. And so the framework in which people ask these things is, is I think, fundamentally skewed. Right. Well, and like you said, going back to something else you said, too, about when Jesus says, love your enemies to the Jews, they what he, you know, the, the most obvious thing was the Romans. Exactly. Who were the oppressors, who were the empire. But now the problem for Christians today in America especially is we are the empire. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and, and, it's, it's, and there's something about fallen human nature that just doesn't like to give that up. You know, it's yeah. like, so we, you know, instead of finding our security in God, we, we easily find it in our nation and in our politics and uh, our military. Uh, all the things that, you know, human beings typically find their security in. Yeah. Um, and then the, from that framework, we hear the teaching of Jesus is nothing but a threat. And so we have to, if we're going to continue to believe that we're followers of Jesus, we have to do something uh, to explain that away. And we end up just saying, oh, he's talking about grouchy neighbors right. uh, and uh, grumpy in-laws and things like that. The thing is, what, what, we're really, what, what really makes this such an important issue, uh, Keith, is that Jesus says, love your enemies, uh, bless those who persecute you, pray for those who despitefully use you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
uh, Matthew 5, 44 and 45. Mm -hmm. So Jesus there is making our willingness to love enemies, life-threatening enemies, nationalistic enemies, personal enemies, that is the litmus test for whether you uh, uh, can be called a child of God. Uh, do you love like the rain falls and like the sun shines? Which means, do you love indiscriminately? The rain doesn't pick and choose who it's going to fall on, and the sun doesn't pick and choose who it's going to shine on. It just does what it does. Yeah. So also, if we're children of the Father, we should just do what we do. And that is manifest the character of the Father, which is revealed on the cross. It's a self-sacrificial love. That itself tells you that it's, it's misguided to ever try to look for the exception clauses here. By definition, there are none. There mm -hmm. are none because it's about the rain and it's about the sun, and therefore it's about everyone. Uh, regardless of whether they're holding a bouquet in front of you or, or a gun in front of you. Right. And now, and I totally, totally, absolutely agree with you on that. And, but then what I also see uh, is this idea of basically one way to sort of end around that a lot of Christians try to do is to redefine what Jesus means by love. So um, that's how you can justify, you know, holding up a sign saying God hates fags. Because mm -hmm. I love them, and that's how I'm expressing love. See, I'm, I'm letting yeah, them yeah, know yeah. that they're going to burn in hell forever and ever and ever. And, and that's, that's how I'm expressing, quote-unquote, love. Right, and, right. And, and love gets redefined as, oh, loving my uh, – Jesus tells me to love my neighbor. So like you said, I should shoot the guy breaking into his house. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm showing love. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it, you just, they kind of get around it by redefining what love looks like. We, we have uh, St. Augustine to thank for that. He was the first one that I know of in church history who – uh, precisely to get around this problem, because he's working at a time when Christianity just inherited all this political power and military power from Constantine, and Christians have done a reframe, thinking, okay, I guess it's our job to you know, rule the world. Uh, we got all this power, and God gave it to us. Jesus identified that authority as coming from the devil, but, but uh, we, we, they think it came from God. And so it, it, the process of that, he defined love as an inner disposition. It's strictly an inner disposition that is not incompatible with burning heretics at the stake. Uh, and uh, there's two, two, two problems with that. One is, Jesus specifically says, do good to those who despitefully use you. Um, act in ways that benefit them. Okay? So it, it, he specifies behavioral implications to his understanding of love. The second thing is that the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms exactly what love is. 1 John 3.16. Here is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, so also we should lay down our life for one another. So love, the kind of love that God is and the kind of love that we're to demonstrate is self-sacrificial love, unconditional self-sacrificial love that ascribes unsurpassable worth to others because we agree with God that, that every person we see was worth God dying for. And we do so at cost to ourselves if necessary. That's what happens on the cross. God says, you are worth me dying for even though we were yet enemies. Um, and, and he's willing to pay whatever price uh, to manifest that, that, that conviction. And that's the kind of love we're to have. So it completely rules out this uh, inner disposition nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I wrote a blog recently where I just took the love chapter and just kind of did a paraphrase, a re I call it a love chapter remix, mm. where I just went through, like, this is what love is. And because, because Christians have tried to redefine it in these kind of crazy ways, to, to kind of help people see, like, no, 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 you don't, you don't get to define what love is. God has already defined what love looks like, mm, and yep. it looks like this. And like you talk about, it's power under, it's not power over. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't give us an abstract definition, which we could always play with. But he gives us a concrete person and a concrete event, and it's the cross. Right. Now, of course, I'm sure you've heard this many, many times, but um, how would you respond to a Christian who says to you that, well, I understand what you're saying, Greg, but... You know, even Paul said in Romans 13 that God's servants, right, the state, mm -hmm. God God ordained this thing called the, the state to wield the sword. Yeah, and so yeah, he's, yeah. he's okay with that. He's okay with there being an empire and there being a, a national army and, uh, and, uh, and police force and people that are using deadly force. And so why can't a Christian join, quote unquote, God's sure. ser servants? It's, it's really interesting how that passage has been used. Uh, you know, in the, in the original, they didn't have chapter divisions. And so you've got to be careful that you don't ever, you know, read chapters in isolation from each other. Romans 13 is con a continuation of Romans 12. Um, and in Romans 12, Paul says, uh, 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 never take vengeance, all right? Uh, never exact vengeance. Leave all vengeance to God. Uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. 
Um, and then he says, instead, you are to feed your enemy when they're hungry and give them something to drink when they're thirsty. Uh, and in doing that, you'll pour uh, uh, hot coals on their head, which was just an idiomatic way of saying bring conviction on them with the hope that they're going to see the wrongness of, their, of what they're doing and, and, and turn around. And he says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so don't let their toxicity get into you and you retaliate. Rather, take the high road, the Christ road, and just keep on loving them. Then he moves on in the next verse and says, God uses the sword of the government to exact vengeance. Okay, it uses the same word. Um, and so he, there he's saying, God is, is using government to do what uh, he just forbid Christians to do. Yeah, God's going to take care. God will right every wrong. God's going to run the world. Um, and he'll use the sort of government to do it. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're supposed to be doing that. Uh, see, that, that, that's the, 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 the uh, Christendom mistake again. We think we're supposed to run the world. No, God will use the governments to do that. Um, uh, our job is to keep on manifesting Christ's character. The other thing is that the, the word that ordain um, or establish, it's sometimes translated, tasso is the root, tasso in Greek. And it, it has a connotation of to file something, to put it in a correct file. Um, and, and so uh, uh, John Yoder uses the analogy of a librarian who files books. Uh, the librarian doesn't necessarily like the book, maybe even despises the book, but um, knows where to put the book. So also, it's like, Paul isn't saying that governments are, the sword-wielding governments are the way that he wants, like he, that was his great idea. No, in fact, you know, in, in, in the original mandate, human beings were supposed to lord over the animal kingdom and the earth, but weren't supposed to lord over each other. We were supposed to only have God as our lord. Governments came about as a result of the fall. But Paul's saying, no, God finds these governments the way they are. They use the sword. They're always going to use the sword until this world's transformed. And so he is influencing that system as much as possible to uh, keep evil in check and to further things. Um, that's just, you know, you, you find him doing that for all, all, all the time in the Old Testament. Uh, and sometimes he'll use a, a nation like Assyria or Babylon and then turn around and punish that nation for being the kind of nation he could use that way. Mm -hmm. So he's not saying I, he approves of this. He hates it. But right. he, he's, he's willing to get his hands dirty and, and, and uh, bring as much good out of that as possible. But there's no, there's, the purpose of the, the, the contrast between Romans 12 and 13 is precisely to say that we have no business doing sword wielding like the government does. And somehow people manage to turn that around to make it mean it's the exact opposite. Oh, we have a duty to fight for our country and to kill when our commanding officer says so. Right. Yeah, and I think especially, again, in America, we're in this weird place where uh, it isn't it isn't a one-to-one -one comparison to what was going on in the first century because, or you know, the second and third and fourth centuries, where uh, to be a Christian, uh, that you could, um, you know, have a vote and you know, we could, our voice could come together politically and we could make some kind of positive change in the, in the political process. Or, um, you know, we could participate in this way, sort of nation building and empire building and that kind of thing. But in America, because it is so, those lines are really blurred for us, you know. Mm. In fact, to be a good Christian is to be a good American. And, that's what, uh, and that's I've asked, what I hear. And I, yeah, well, yeah. And I've, and I've tried to help. One thing I try to do to help friends of mine and family members that I know uh, try to separate this idea. And maybe you can help me think about this as well. Um, because to me, I think it's one of the biggest problems of the church in America today is to understand that you can be a sincere, genuine follower of Jesus and not be a capitalist or a Republican or a Democrat uh, or someone who's nationalistic and that, you know, mm. that if, if someone hears the gospel in North Korea and genuinely, you know, understands the gospel of the kingdom, uh, receives Jesus as his Lord and Savior and begins to, immediately to, to give his life over to Christ, does he also become a capitalist or does he also <laughs> become a Republican? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and for a lot of Christians, they can't even imagine that. That that he he wouldn't become a Republican right. or something. Well, I've actually like, had yeah, people yeah. tell me that he better he would be better off if he did, mm, yeah, as if yeah, that would yeah. be an option for him. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, it, it is part of the um, bondage of the fallen world throughout history is that people have tend to tend to always deify uh, their their nation, uh, their politics. It's a way of getting life. You feel. Uh, it's a it's an idolatrous way of getting life. You, you know that our country is the best country. Our country is the right country. My political opinions are the right opinion. God always agrees with with me. You know it's it's right. it's that kind of thing. So we give divine authority to our own opinions, and there's nothing uniquely American about that. Uh, it, it's been yeah. the the case. I mean, think about it. Um, 
it, it'd be pretty hard to uh, go out and be willing to kill and die for your country unless you thought it was right. And it's, it's kind of coincidental, isn't it, that whatever country people are in, uh, with very few exceptions, that's the one that they think is right, to the point where they'll kill and die for it. Um, and it, it's, and, and it, it's in the interest of the, the leaders of this thing to not have people notice this, you know, uh, uh, how arbitrary it is. You know, you're just brainwashed into thinking your country is right, you know. It's, this is why I, I find this in, incident that happened in the First World War uh, oh, yeah. at Kristallnacht where the, the troops uh, ended up celebrating Christmas together. Uh, it, you know, they were in the trenches fighting one another, killing each other, but then they called a, a break for a week between Christmas and New Year's. And in that time, uh, they got to be good friends. And, and, and see, what happened then is that uh, as you humanize your enemy, you know, before it was just the Germans, you know, fighting the French, French, Germans, Britons, all that. Now they become human beings. And you, you, you come to realize, you know, Hans, the German, gets to realize that, uh, you know, Johannes here, the French guy, uh, if they were born in the same country, they'd be fighting on the same side and they'd probably be best friends. But because of the arbitrariness of them being born in different places, now they got to try to kill each other. And so after a week, you know, the generals don't want, this has got to stop, you know, fraternizing with the enemy because you can't, it's much harder to kill someone once they're a human being. You know, they got to be Krauts or Japs or whatever you want to call them. We put them in these categories. Um, and so they call it an end of this whole thing. And so one minute, you know, Hans and whatever the other guy's name Hey, bro. Okay. Hey, you there? Yeah, I'm here. But I can't see you. What happened? We just sort of crashed. I think that was me. Did you crash me? I think I think I might have crashed. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, you guys should turn your camera on. Oh, okay. Hold on. There we are. Sorry about that. Uh, so. Uh, you were in the middle of talking about uh, the other yeah, the World War One and the. Um... Yeah, how about if I just start there? I'll just make sure, it that's great. Uh, this is why I love that episode that happened in the First World War, where um, I'm sure you've heard about it, where the you know the, the two sides um, were fighting each other, and uh, you know they, they had this trench warfare going on, and they decided to call a truce from Christmas to to, to New Year's, uh, and and so the, the two sides get together, German, French, and others who were involved in this, and and. You know, for a week they're playing soccer together and drinking and smoking together and playing cards and having fun. And see, what that does is it humanizes the face of the enemy and makes it much harder for them to kill. And you realize the arbitrariness of, of, uh, uh, of, of this whole thing. Uh, you, you know, you take Hans and, and Bob and they get together and they, you know, show each other their pictures of their wives and kids and, and they, they have fun for a week. And they realize that had they been born on the same side, they'd be fighting alongside of each other and they'd probably be best friends. Uh, but simply because they were born in different places and their different leaders say you got to kill each other, now they got to kill each other. Um, and this is why the generals called it off. When they heard about it, they were furious because they know that conducting this war requires everyone to believe that they're right. Mm -hmm. uh, we stand for truth and righteousness, only us. They're the evil ones, we're the good ones. And, and, and not notice the arbitrariness that that's what everybody thinks. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. No one's gone into a, a war thinking. I'm fighting on the wrong side. Uh, I'm, I'm fighting for the wrong ideals. I'm fighting for the wrong king. No, everyone believes this. Kingdom people just need to see how arbitrary this, this is. Um, the other thing I, I'd say, Keith, is this, that I, I, it, it, this idea that this, our ability to vote makes us so distinctive, and, and that's why the situation is so different from the day of Jesus. I, I think that is just a crock. Uh, we've always voted. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of options Jews had uh, on, on voting for things. Um, and, and, you know, some, some, some voted by sabotaging the, the Roman, uh, you know, uh, carriers and, and, and others by assassinating them and others by saying, no, we just got to go along with them and others by subversively, you know, uh, not paying taxes. And there, there's, there's all these, we, we vote with our life. We vote with our feet. We vote with our actions. Um, and so Jesus, when he comes along, he's simply saying, here's how you should cast your vote. This, what you check off in a ballot box every four years is the least of your votes. You know, we vote with every decision we make, and we all, people have throughout history. So, so the idea that you know, uh, we should uh, be more aligned with our government because we have an ability to vote is, I think, uh, just a, a complete misconception. Yeah. And now, what would you say to a Christian who said to you, yeah, okay, Greg, but, but we do live in America— and uh, we do have this freedom. So what's wrong with doing both? Why can't we uh, affect change in the culture by voting a certain way or advocating a certain way and by, uh, you know, the kingdom? 
Yeah, but you know, if I, 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 I don't, I don't make a doctrine out of or dogma <laughs> that you can't, you can't vote. Um, yeah, you know, Paul at one point, uh, you know, when he was getting beaten up, he, he said to the soldiers, "Hey, wait, you guys, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this." So he was speaking to authorities, you know, and, and although he was doing it for the purpose of the gospel, to spread the gospel. So you could say, well, then vote in ways that, you know, will be conducive to the spreading of the gospel. So I, I, I don't want to make a doctrine out of this, but I would say this, that um, the reason I don't vote is this. I, I believe I'm supposed to have all my eggs in one basket and all my trust in one basket and uh, only have one Lord and one president without any competitors. Um, and I am to regard the systems of this world as already in principle having passed away. They're obsolete. Um, uh, and, and I'm to manifest the reign of God in everything I do, and I'm to consider myself a foreigner in a strange land, a missionary, an ambassador. Uh, if, it, uh, if I was a missionary in the other land, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it's my job to vote. I'm aware that, uh, you know, Paul said, a good soldier doesn't become involved in civilian affairs, but is always seeking to please his enlisting officer, 1 Timothy 2.4. And so if I truly believe that the, all the hope of the world is in Jesus, and he's my only Lord, and my only job is to obey him, then why would I vote? Uh, it's like uh, you only vote if you think it actually makes a, a significant difference. Right. Um, the other thing is that I, I can't vote without caring about it. And the minute I care about it, I start to uh, see my opinions against those other opinions, and I can get sucked into the toxicity of this whole system where everybody, you know, is our country's becoming increasingly polar, polarized between MSNBC and Fox News. And... Um, uh, losing the capacity to even talk to each other, and that, it, whatever happens, that must not get into the church, although it's already yeah. all over the place. Yeah. It's toxic, venomous. It, it's, so if you're going to play politics, I encourage people to be very, very, very careful and, and, and to not have it mean nothing to them. Yeah. Uh, so they, they don't start to see the world through that grid. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you, and it breaks my heart when I see Christians who get so distracted by politics and get polarized, as you're saying, and then, then it almost becomes like they can't talk about anything else. Um, and, and that's what grieves me is that like, I, w I wish I could see as much passion in your heart about loving your neighbor, or mm -hmm. as much passion in your heart about children in your own city that are starving, you know, they're living in a motel or a car down the street, like, where's that passion? You know, yeah, you're right. What happens then is that, um, just having that uh, any amount of trust in what government does will incline people to think that the way we're going to change the world is through government, whereas the call of the gospel is not for us to be Caesar's wise advisors on what he should do, but rather just to do it. Yeah. You know, and so you and I could have totally different opinions about what Caesar should do about uh, you know, the dilapidated state of inner city schools. Uh, and we get nowhere, and I think that you're not really a Christian. You might think I'm not really a Christian, because <laughs> if you really were, you'd be voting for me. It's so much judgment all over the place. It's right. antithetical to the gospel. Uh, but instead, we could just say, hey, listen, let's get a shovel and some paint and some window washing and some people, and let's go down there and fix the school. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus gets the credit for it rather than, 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 than Uncle Sam. So what we have is a church that is very heated up about what Caesar should do. In the meantime, it's not doing what it was called to do. And right. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with that picture. Yeah, I totally agree, Greg. Hey, we're probably running up on the end of our time, all right? Yep, yep, that's fine. Okay. I, 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 I've got five more minutes if you want to go five more minutes, but... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to run something by you that I've sure. been thinking. Um, again, I told you, you know, I've sort of backed up a little bit, and, and instead of talking so much about nonviolence and pacifism, because ultimately I don't think that pacifism is what I, I'm really passionate about uh, in itself. What I'm passionate about is... Here's what Jesus said. How do we take him seriously? And so trying to, even in my own mind, rethink how do I help my brothers and sisters in the church who are kind of trapped in this nationalism and uh, mm. this way of thinking. Uh, one thing that I hit on was I think it's the idea that we, I feel like, and I want your, re your, re your reaction. I feel like we, as the church, have lost faith in the transformational power of the love of Christ. Mm. It's almost as if we don't really believe that if what we that the transformational love of Christ is powerful enough, that it's strong enough, that it can actually change a human heart. It actually could change our community. It could actually transform our nation. We think, well, yeah, you know, love is nice, whatever. But, you know, man, if we could just get this guy elected, we could accomplish so much more. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, the thing is, Keith, is that, that um, uh, 
Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 1, he goes, you know, to the world, to the Jews and Gentiles, the cross uh, is, the, uh, is foolishness and its weakness. And what kind of God, all-powerful God, comes down to earth and gets himself crucified yeah. uh, when he could easily just crush his enemies? And so it looks foolish and it looks weak. But to us who are being saved, it is the wisdom and the power of God. Uh, and, and throughout the New Testament, we're called to manifest that power and that wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, but see, if, if we're not thinking in kingdom categories then it will seem weak, and even if we say we believe it, we'll still on some level think it's weak and powerless, so we're not going to put it into practice. Come on, let's get practical. What really changes is the, what the president does, what the Congress does, whatever. we got to take that kind of power, and so we end up trying to grab the power to control and to enforce our superior wills on others uh, instead of taking up the cross and saying, how can we serve others? Uh, whereas the whole kingdom thing is, what the resurrection is about is, is God's verification that this is the way not only of, of human beings to be reconciled to God, but this is what's going to transform the world. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what's going to win in the end of the day. Uh, every other kind of power is going to fall to the ground. Um, we either believe that or we don't, but I, I'm afraid if you're conditioned by the way of the world, uh, it, it strikes you as ludicrous. Uh, yeah. And so you'll always be end up defaulting to uh, the people who have got the, 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 the power mongers, the people who hold the cards. How, how do I get in on them? How, how do we influence them? Because that's where change really happens. Right. It's unfortunate. Yeah, it is. So I, I, I'll just end by saying, uh, I, I think what it is to die to ourselves and make Christ Lord uh, is to die to the world's way of thinking, the pattern of this world, which always has assumed that the, the real power is in the ones who hold the political authority and military authority, the one who has the sword, the one who's got the gun. That's who you respect, and you try to get in good with them. And, you know, Jesus said, the pagans, they're always lording over one another, and the benefactors are those on top. Uh, but it shall not be so among you, he says in Matthew 20. And, and I just encourage people to realize just how, um, how deeply rooted the pagan assumptions can be, and we don't even notice it. We just, we, Jesus gets co-opted into the pagan system, the power over system, uh, without even noticing it, when what is called for is a complete radical subversion of the whole thing. That whole way of thinking uh, is, is what is the root of all evil. It's not the solution to it. Yeah. It, it is the devil's greatest lie to think that the very thing that's causing the cancer is the thing that's going to uh, solve the cancer. If we just kill a few more of the bad guys, we just got the right people in office, if we just passed the right laws, if we just got rid of these evil people or shut them up, then the world would be fixed. And we've been thinking that for how many thousand years and where has it gotten us? It's yeah. a merry-go-round of bloodshed and hatred. We're called to opt out of that entire system and to pursue a radically foolish, weak way of transforming the world. Amen. And there's my sermon. Amen. Let the kingdom right. come, man. All right. Well, God Thank bless you, man. Keep up the good work. You too, Greg. Thanks. God bless, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.